Okay, there we go. All right, so again, welcome everyone to PMP training. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about starting the project part four. So I'm looking at the schedule and I can see that you had starting the project part one, two, and three, and it looks like Bill Garner and Harry Dosher were uh, the instructors on all three of the previous ones. So tonight we have myself, Chris Williams, and we have Cindy Horton, and we're going to guide you through the sections that you see up on the screen. Uh, but before we jump into it, well, I will say that uh, Cindy's going to cover plan and manage quality of products and deliverables. And then I'm going to pick up and finish us with integrate project planning activities and plan and manage procurement. Tonight's content is a lot of content. So we are going to try to make sure that we get through this. Uh, some of these classes are lighter, much lighter than tonight. So we're going to do our best to, uh, to keep it fun and moving uh, and not let us get drowned down into one particular area. So uh, with that, let me start off with just a little introduction and then I'm going to hand it off to Cindy and let her do the same and then we can get started. So again, as I said, my name is Chris Williams. I'm a director in the Global Project Management Team here at AT&T. Uh, and my job, we live within the organization of project management. That's what we do. Uh, my team will support uh, data, new data ads or conversions or migration from another uh, network or carrier. Uh, but we, we help implement new data networks for our customers. So. The PMs on my team get to interface directly with our customers. They get to interface with all of our in, in, uh, internal departments to help, you know, start up our uh, data for our customers. So we, we live and work a lot around what we learn within the PMI. So it's always good to, um, to get back and, and as an instructor to refresh myself on some of these different topics. So um, a little bit back, just a little bit more on myself and I'll hand it off. Is, I joined the project management team back in 2017, so uh, about four years of experience now working in this role. I, I achieved, got, received, whatever you want to call it, my PMP back in 2018, right in the beginning of 2018. Uh, and shortly after that, I, I decided that I want to kind of keep it moving and I wanted to give back. So I started, uh, I signed up to be an instructor and I signed up to be a, um, a supporting instructor and then doing some of the front end of the end of the instructor. And I've, I really enjoyed this role. It's fun. And uh, one of the goals that I have and Cindy has, we, we talk about this often as we try to make the content fun and interesting as much as we can, uh, because I know this, this has a tendency to, uh, I'll just say it, be boring, right? If you read the PMBOK guide, you can bore yourself. So anything we can do to help it make it interesting so that you can learn it better, uh, is going to help you when it comes to the test. And as we go through the content tonight, we'll try to highlight things that we think will be on the exam that you want to pay attention to or things that you want to remember or learn. So Cindy and I will both try to point those out as we see them. So again, that's me. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. My name is Cindy Horton. I'm a, currently a senior privacy manager with Warner Media. I came over into the Warner Media organization via Xander, which is our ed tech platform. And uh, prior to that, I started uh, back in with uh, AT&T, actually it was Bell South Mobility, it was in 2000. Um, and I would say, you know, I've, I've traveled around the company a good bit, but about half of my career with the company has been in, in a quality role. And um, most of my career has always been managing projects of some sort, whether I, whether I held a project management title or not. Um, I was uh, also managing projects, um, but my, my work and quality, I've always had a real passion for it, so I really enjoy uh, teaching this portion of the, the uh, program and everything that we've laid out for you guys. Um, I'm very excited about it and happy to share um, any of my experiences, and I'll kind of pepper some of that in a little as we go. Um, I got my PMP in uh, the fall of 2017. And I've, um, I've done some volunteer work here and there with the PMN, but started with the education organization a little over a year ago. I uh, started partnering with Chris. So Chris and I have been uh, partnering on these classes for, for quite some time now. And I uh, really have I've come with a good cadence. Um, and as he said, we try to make it a little bit interesting um, and not drone. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to infuse a little bit of our excitement about project management, particularly these topics as we, uh, we address them tonight. So looking forward to it. Thank you, Chris.
Chris, would you like me to go ahead and get started then tonight? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and get started. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so um, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. So as Chris mentioned tonight, I'm gonna to be covering plan and manage quality of products and deliverables, and then he'll be hitting the next two um, tasks right after that. Um, and he's also, basically we've covered the objectives, right? So um, let's go ahead and get started then with plan and manage quality of products and deliverables. So all projects must be of a certain type of quality, right? Um, what that level of quality is, the expectations around the quality, how the project's quality is to be measured, uh, how it will be aligned to the project's objective, and how the quality is to be tracked and reported are a few, actually it's quite a bit <laughs> of the important aspects of managing project quality. There's a lot to do and consider when it comes to assuring and delivering quality deliverables and products. And the product project manager is responsible for planning and managing the quality of the project's products and the deliverables. Okay. Planning and managing quality is a task in the process domain of, that, that you find listed on page A in the exam content outline or the ECO. And there are enablers or work, an enabler or work are the same word here, that facilitate the task of planning and managing quality. So the work or enablers associated with the task of planning and managing quality include, but are not necessarily limited to, determining or identifying the quality standard required for project deliverables, recommending options for improvement based on quality gaps, and continually surveying the quality of project deliverables. The net net of it is when it all comes down to it, if, if you get to the end of the project and you, you, you now turn to your sponsors and say, hey, here's the product or the service that we've, we've, uh, we've created for you, um, and they say, hey, that doesn't match my expectations, then, then now you're set with you know, some major hurdles to overcome, right? And it can add undue cost, uh, time, and of course it can also impact your reputation as a, pro as, a, um, as a company and as a project manager. So again, quality is extremely important, a very important aspect of the project management process. Okay. Um, some of the deliverables and tools that we'll use um, as we, we plan quality are listed here. Uh, deliverables such as the quality management plan and defining quality metrics. That's where we're going to focus tonight. And then when you look at tools, we'll also be talking about cost of quality, quality audit, and quality measurement tools. Um, some of these other items that are listed here, we're going to necessarily speak to them tonight, so I do encourage you to make sure that you have a clear understanding of these items. So you'll definitely want to make sure that you're reading the PMBOK and also other materials make sure you have a good grasp on these particular areas that we may not cover. Okay. So what is quality? Well, it is the degree to which a set of inherent characteristics fulfill requirements, right? That sounds, sounds a little uh, dry in some respects, but it's the expectations of what the, the product or the service uh, will be, and it also comes from the standpoint of what the stakeholders expect. The stated imply and implied quality needs are inputs for devising your project requirements. In business, quality should be feasible, meaning it should be achievable, right? And it should be modifiable, you should be able to change it, and it should be measurable. Those are your, your, your qualities. Um, the quality standards that need to be met must be managed throughout the whole life of the project. You can't just do it at one point. You've got to ma manage and measure throughout the life, life um, life cycle of the project. At the beginning of the project, the project manager should plan quality policies and procedures that can be managed and controlled throughout the project using the organization's quality management system. Continuous Ms. process. Cindy? Yes, uh-huh. I'm so sorry to cut you off, but what I'm seeing on the screen, it could just be me, is still the quality of the degree to which a set of inherent characteristics fulfill requirements and the picture of the lady with the glasses. Yes. Are you, uh -huh. are you reading from another slide? No. Uh, oh, okay, just your notes. Okay, cool, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I know the, the slides certainly won't contain a lot, you know, everything I say uh, or, or always be a, a direct uh, reflection of that, but thank you for, for asking. Continuous, uh, continuous process improvement activities also need to be considered for the benefit of the project. And it's also important to remember that project quality may be affected 
by applicable standards, regulations, and laws. And we'll um, touch a little bit more on that right now. Okay. So a standard is a document established by an authority, a custom, or general consent as a model or example. You probably all have had some interaction with a standard of some sort, right? Standards are typically voluntary guidelines or characteristics that have been approved by a recognized body of experts, such as the International Organization of Standardization or the ISO. And in some cases, the standards body will provide certification that suppliers conform to the requirements of their standards often. Um, the conformance to standards is also um, a customer requirement. Um, regulations, those are requirements imposed by a governmental body and often come from laws. Um, these requirements can establish product, process, or service characteristics, including applicable and administrative provisions that have a government mandated compliance. Um, you know, being in the uh, telephone business, right, the communications business, we, we have a lot of uh, regulations um, that we have to adhere by in our business as well, right? Um, standards are often um, accepted as de facto best practices describing a preferred approach and may later become de jure re regulations such as using the critical path method, which I think y'all are familiar with, in scheduling major construction projects. Um, in my area of the business, um, the business uses data to produce advertising services. You know, we, we too have to abide by laws and regulations, as well as our own privacy policies um, that govern how that data can be used and how we can share it. Um, the product managers that I work with, they're, they're responsible for ensuring that these requirements are incorporated into the product or service. And if those, um, if those requirements aren't met, those um, uh, privacy rules and so forth, regulations aren't met, um, then the product or service doesn't meet the expectations of all the stakeholders and the product or service would not be considered privacy compliant. Um, products and other outputs are measured against the quality standards set by the project, and quality is assured through the project per tools, methods, and the timing planned. Um, when the quality standards are neither met nor within the acceptable ranges, corrections and controls have to be put into action. Um, whether deliverables are controlled or within the standards throughout, the validation performed by the project team and verified by the customer or the business equals a validated deliverable or validated deliverable. So again, your customer or your business has to, has to, in the end, validate the deliverables in order for it to be deemed a quality product or uh, product or service. All project deliverables must, again, be validated based on quality standards or acceptance criteria that has been agreed upon earlier as you planned your quality efforts. Looking at the quality management plan, you'll see a sample here of what one might look like. Um, the quality management plan is a component of the overall project or program management plan. Um, it describes how your applicable policies, procedures, and guidelines are going to be implemented to achieve the quality objectives. It also documents and defines how the project's quality requirements are going to be met and how the quality aspect of the project will be managed. Quality requirements and standards need to be gathered and documented for both the project and its deliverables. How the project will de demonstrate what the quality requirements and standards have been met and how that will be validated will also need to be determined and documented. So it's a, it's a, a very formal activity that you're engaging in here. It's not something that can be left to chance or we just assume that everybody understands what's going on. Just as other parts of our, our planning have to be documented, so does the quality management plan. And again, it is a component or an output of that planning process, okay? And it exists as a, an overall component of your project management plan. Um, and so that, uh, that's uh, how our quality management plan looks. And then now let's talk about some, some um, other key terms that you're going to want to be familiar with. Again, we're only going to be touching on, on some of those terms, but you'll want to make sure, you're, you're, again, you're, you're looking at your, your, your PMBOK and, and becoming familiar with all the terms, especially if you don't have a lot of experience in the quality planning uh, process here. OK? 
okay? So cost of quality, right? Cost of quality refers to all the costs incurred over the life of the product by investment in preventing nonconformance to the requirements, appraisal of the product or the service for conformance to the requirements, and failure to meet the requirements. Cost of quality can be broken down into two categories that you see listed here, cost of conformance and cost of nonconformance. Um, cost of conformance is the money we, we actively spend or plan to spend during a project to avoid failures, and it includes prevention costs that build a high-quality product and appraisal costs that assess that quality. Um, examples of prevention costs include training, doing things right the first time, and following documented processes, whereas appraisal costs include testing and inspection. Um, in my uh, role when I was with the customer um, care organization for our business uh, call centers, um, one of my, my primary, it was my primary role was to oversee the, the quality management of our call centers. So how our representatives interacted with our customers when they called in um, to have issues resolved. We, we had a clear delineation of things that they the, that the representatives should do in order to make sure that they understood the customers' problems, that they could re, they could rephrase and, and paraphrase back what the customer's problem was, so that they knew they had a good understanding of it, and then also you know following the methods and procedures that had been defined based on the type of problem the customer was calling. All of this was to assure that we got it right the first time, right? We actually addressed the problem fully so that you know, our customers didn't have to call us back repetitively, which could raise the cost of our services, right, and erode our bottom line. So those are some examples of preventative costs that we do. Um, cost of nonconformance um, is the other category, and it's the money we spend after a project is complete um, because failures um, uh, because of failures, and it includes also internal and external failure costs. Um, internal failures can be found um, during the project, um, including such things as reworking and scrap materials, right? Um, external failures are found by the customer, uh, for example, liabilities, warranty work, you know, and lost business due to poor quality product and or our damaged reputation. Those are all the examples of cost of quality. Um, another term to be very familiar with um, is quality metrics. Um, a quality metric is a description of a project or a product attribute and how we measure it. Um, the tolerance is the allowable variation in this measurement. For example, a quality metric on the schedule could say that the schedule needs to stay within plus or minus 10% of the actual schedule. Uh, when the measurement falls outside this range, action needs to be taken. Um, other examples of quality metrics include things like budget variance, um, defect count, requirements coverage, um, and failure rates. And I'm sure y'all probably could think of, of quite a, a number of other types of, uh, of quality metrics as well. A quality audit um, is a structured or independent process to determine if project activities comply with the organizational and project policies and procedures. Um, so, you know, you're going you're gonna to build your quality plan, right, and, and anticipate that it's going to produce a quality product or service, but you're going to want to make sure that you're checking, you know, that, that, that your quality plan is being executed, um, and that's part of, of, of what we would call an audit, right? Audits can take place at scheduled or random intervals. Um, the auditor may be a trained individual from within the performing organization, or it could be a qualified representative from a third-party organization. Um, during a quality audit, the quality management plan is analyzed to make sure that it's still reflective of what has been learned in the project and to make sure that the operational definitions are still adequate and valid. The results of a quality audit are important for the current project as well as for later projects or other parts of the organization. You know, generally when we hear the word audit, it tends to bring about a bit of fear. I don't know how many of y'all have maybe been, your organization has undergone an audit of some sort. I've been through several. Um, and these are generally from within the company. AT&T has their own audit organization. 
Um, and you can also, of course, think, you know, in, in a personal term, you know, you've heard of tax audits, for example, right? It's pretty unnerving to some degree to go through an inspection, but, um, but there are various objectives, both affirming mm -hmm. and corrective actions that are accomplished by performing quality um, audits. And some of these objectives include um, helping the team to be more productive by providing assistance for processing implementation improvements. Um, it helps us to identify the best, practice that, best practices that have been implemented, and then these can be applied to future projects. Um, it can help us to identify the flaws or deficiencies in a project processes. And doing so at early, again early, can help ensure that we're going to have project success and meet our timelines. Um, and it can also help us to use the best practices followed in similar projects performed earlier, and it can highlight the contributions of each quality audit in the organization's lesson learned library. Uh, so again, um, other people who come later and do similar projects um, can learn from us, okay? Um, several topics that can be included in a quality audit, and when I say topics, things that, that can be focused on in a quality audit include, you know, the quality management policy. Um, the quality management policy, it can be evaluated to determine how well management uses quality data and how well others in the organization understand how the data is being used. The evaluation might include an analysis of management policies for collection, analysis, and use of data in decision making or strategic planning. Um, another, um, another focus might be collection and use of information, right? The collection and use of information may be evaluated to determine how well the project team is collecting, distributing, and using quality data. Items for analysis in this category might include consistency of data collection processes, speed of information distribution, and also the use of quality data in decision making. Um, another area is analytical methods. Um, the analytical methods being used may be evaluated to determine if the best analytic method, analytical methods are being used consistently and how well their results are being used. Um, items for audit might include how analysis topics and analysis methods are selected, what technology is used, and how results are fed back to others in the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Warner Media collects a lot of consumer data from products and services that we offer, and we collect and process and share data in alignment with approved processes, policies, regulations, and laws. If we don't, we could expose our personal, you know, personal information of our customers in error, and we could possibly face very heavy fines. Um, not only would this affect our bottom line, but of course it would affect our reputation if we're not in compliance. So um, how we collect, how we analyze, how we, um, how we apply our, our policies and so forth, um, all those are, are fodder for being audited, right? Just to make sure that we're doing things properly and that we are also identifying opportunities for improvement. Um, another another uh, focus of a quality audit could be the cost of quality, right? Um, the cost of quality may be evaluated to determine the most effective proportion between prevention, inspection, and cost of repair or rework. Um, so we want to find out where we're we spending most of our, our, um, our efforts from a quality standpoint and does it make sense to do it in those proportions. Um, and then we've got the, uh, another area also is quality process design. Um, it could be evaluated to determine how, how process design, process analysis, and statistical process control should be used to establish and improve the capability of a process. So, so in the net net of it is there's a lot of different areas that could be looked at from audit, but these are some of the, the, the uh, most prominent ones that would probably be looked at from an audit standpoint. Um, so guidelines for management, managing quality. Um, effective quality management provides confidence that the project's product or service will satisfy relevant quality requirements and standards. Um, to manage the quality of your project, you'll want to follow some of the following guidelines. First, ensure that a, a random and or a scheduled quality audits are conducted by qualified auditors so that they evaluate the quality management plan, your testing procedures, in your measurement criteria. For example, are the quality parameters set forth in the quality management plan valid? Um, are the operational definitions and checklists adequate and appropriate for achieving our desired final results? Um, are the testing methods being implemented correctly? 
um, and is the data being interpreted, recorded, and fed back into the system properly? Um, so those are some of the things that we'd be looking at there. Another area would be um, using one or more of the managed quality tools and techniques to determine the causes of quality problems of the project's product service systems or processes. You know, one method's probably not always going to be the, 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 uh, the better thing to do. You might have two or three that you want to use to make sure, you know, that you're, you're catching any gaps, right? Um, and then an, another guideline for managing quality is to identify and implement the appropriate actions then to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the project team work uh, results to improve quality in the product or service. Um, Y'all you know, might have already heard of the PCDA, you know, the Plan, um, Check, Do, Act cycle. Um, if you haven't, you should become familiar with that, that you'll find that information in, in your PMBOK, but the PCDA is a good way of doing it. Plan your quality, check your quality, do your quality, right, and then act on it, right? So you want to follow that type of a cycle when you're managing um, quality. So let's shift a little bit. Let's talk uh, about some quality measurement tools, okay? Um, so th there are a variety of tools that are available, you know, for surveying the quality of your project. These certainly are not um, the only ones um, out there, but these are a few that are, are kind of the most common. Uh, again, you'll want to re uh, review the PMBOK and make sure you're familiar with many of the other tools that they um, describe there as well. But the ones we'll talk about tonight um, are control charts and variability, Pareto charts, um, statistical sampling, and the statistical sampling process. Now, this slide right here, I, I just took the liberty of compiling. So if you're, I, I compiled this, uh, this chart in the next two. So if you're uh, following along, there may be a printout um, of the, of the uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, you'll notice uh, and that I've just combined these um, all into one. It just made it a lot easier to talk to it, in my opinion. But um, anyway, please, uh, so let's talk first about control charts. So control charts are bar graphs that are used to analyze and communicate the variability of a process or project activity over time. Control charts help show the potential capability of the process, and they suggest the range of variability in the process. Now, this range of variability can assist a project manager in determining if the variance is caused by a common or assignable sources. The components of a control chart include the process mean, the upper control limit, or UCL, and the lower control limit, or the LCL. The process mean is determined by taking samples from the actual process, and we'll talk about sampling in a moment, but taking samples from the actual process and calculating the statistical mean. As additional samples are taken and tested, they are evaluated in terms of standard deviations from that process mean. And for most repetitive processes, the UCL would be, be three standard deviations above the mean, while the LCL, LCL will be three standard deviations below the mean. Um, the range of variability in a process, again, can assist the project manager in determining if variance is caused by common or assignable sources. If the process variability ends up fluctuating around the average or the statistical mean, the process shows very little variability and is considered to be stable, right? So if, all, if most of my points, in other words, are around, are around the statistical mean, that line that has the X, the bar X denotation there, then my, my uh, process or my, uh, my, my quality process is, is, uh, is, is considered to be stable, right? Um, excessive variability is indicative of an unstable process, and there are two types of instability. Number one, measurements that are above the UCL or below the LCL result from unstable process. Data points A and B are, and, and the figures here reflect that type of instability. You see we've got uh, A above the UCL, B below the UCL, right, the, the uh, third standard deviation. Um, a second type of instability exists when seven or more consecutive measurements are above or below the process mean, and this is shown by data points C and D in the figures, and it indicates that there has been a shift in the mean. This seven-point variance is called the seven-run rule, and you can, uh, I would be surprised if you don't see this on the exam. I saw it in mind, and you'll just want to make sure you're very 
uh, very un you understand this very well. Okay. Uh, it's important to remember that while control charts can effectively show variability, they don't indicate the source of the variability or show performance in relation to an expected performance. Um, the control chart shows only the capability of the process to produce similar products. It does not show the conformity of that process to a customer's specification. Okay? Uh, so the whole intent here of, of having a control chart and variability is simply to identify if your process is out of control and then to start now from here, we've got to start asking questions to find out why do we have this, these, this variation, right? We've got to start doing some inspection or investigation. I think that's all I have to say on that. Yep, and I'm skipping my next two there. Okay. Um, now let's talk about Pareto charts. Um, Y'all may, may be familiar with Pareto charts, um, but a Pareto chart is a histogram. That's one key thing to, to remember. It is a histogram, um, and it's used to rank causes of problems in a hierarchical format. Um, and, and hierarchical, as you can see, you know, we've got um, these bars going down in, in relation to the measurements that have been taken, right? Uh, so we can see here that overpriced is a, is a, a primary uh, uh, source of complaint here as you look at that, um, that side of the chart right there. But a Pareto chart is a histogram, and it helps us to rank causes of problems in a hierarchical format. The goal is to narrow down the primary causes of variance on a project and focus the energy and efforts of tackling the most significant sources of variance. The variables in the chart are ordered by the frequency of the occurrences. Again, so you got overpriced, small portions, noisy, food not fresh, table not clean, that's the order. A typical Pareto chart is used to represent data which you first organize in descending order of occurrences and then you plot the cumulative curve the bars represent the number of failures for each of the causes, A through E. In this example, approximately 72% of the total number of failures are due to causes A and B, 320 out of 440. The project, can, can, the project team can easily see by this, from this chart that they should focus most of their corrective actions and efforts on those two causes. Uh, Pareto analysis. Um, is, the, is, the, is the analysis used to develop the Pareto charts, okay? So that's what Pareto analysis is, is just using this analysis to develop the Pareto charts. Um, and it was named after Vilfredo Pareto. It's kind of got a, a rhyming name there, Vilfredo Pareto. He was an Italian co economist in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in his analysis, Vilfredo Pareto found or concluded that 80% of the land in the late 19th century Italy was controlled by 20% of the population. Um, during a Pareto analysis, uh, data is collected in various forms, such as reports and inspections, and as well as surveys. Um, this data is then analyzed to isolate those major causes of project variance and is assigned a frequency um, of percentage value. Uh, the resulting chart is a histogram, like we see here, um, that identifies specific sources of variance and it ranks them according to their effect on quality performance. Uh, Pareto charts can be useful tools throughout the entire project for prioritizing and focusing on corrective actions. Comparative analysis of Pareto charts at different points in the project can be an effective tool for determining and communicating the, the, uh, uh, the corrective actions have had, uh, determining what the effect that those corrective actions have had um, curtailing or, or hopefully even eliminating the variability. Uh, so you'll often hear, you know, this referred to as the 80-20 rule, okay? Pareto's charts are based on Pareto's law, which is known as the 80-20 rule. Um, the 80-20 rule is a general guideline with many applications. Um, in terms of controlling processes, it contends that a relatively large number of prob problems or defects Typically, 80% are commonly due to a relatively small number of causes, typically 20%. Um, most projects have limited resources available to them. Leveraging histograms and Pareto analysis, project managers can remove most defects by focusing their resources on the primary sources of the defects. Okay, and that's the main thrust of, of uh, doing Pareto analysis. And then statistical sampling, another tool here, right? 
Uh, statistical sampling is defined as choosing part of a population of interest for inspection. Um, it's a technique that's used to determine the characteristics of an entire population based on actual measurement of a representative sample of that population. A sampling is a way to determine if large batches of a project should be accepted or rejected without having to test every single item produced. Uh, it's a goal, its goal is to produce a process that does not require inspection of every item. And the size of the samples and the frequency and cost of sampling must be determined when you're planning the project quality. Um, a common example of statistical sampling is polling. Uh, polling organizations ask questions to a small or a random sample of participants. The answers given by the sample group are used, are, are used to suggest how an entire group may feel regarding an issue, okay? Um, and, and we're all, you know, pretty familiar with, um, with you know, certain types of polls. I mean, we get polled ourselves within the company, our, our surveys or, you know, some examples of, of it can be based, the, the final results or the final understanding how it might apply across the whole population of the employees can be based off a, of, of sampling um, and a margin of error, right? Um, sample size, um, how, how, many, how many that you actually pull or you, or you um, inspect, um, the size of that sample can affect the accuracy of the results too, of course. The larger the sample size, the higher the likelihood the sample will really represent the variability of the population. Um, in quality terms, the larger the sample size, the more, confident, more confidence you can have that your measurements reflect the quality level of the entire project population. But, you know, once again, most projects have limited resources. You can't really inspect all outputs, as this could probably have an impact on your budget and or the timeline. Um, so sampling is a, is a useful technique for validating quality. Um, and again, note that it's, it's important that members of a team whose focus is on quality control have a really strong understanding of statistics. Um, so if you're a project manager and you've got to really, you know, really make sure that, that there's a lot of... Um, of clarity in your in your quality, um, you know, output and so forth. You, you may need to have that skill set within your team. Someone who really has a good handling handle on the on statistics. Um, I, I had to deal with it quite a bit um, in in my role, um, and got very familiar with statistical processes. And it's a it's a, a great tool to have in your your arsenal as a project manager specifically. Okay. Um, let's talk about the stamp, uh, statistical sampling process. Um, so the statistical sampling process involves sampling data into two, uh, I'm sorry, involves dividing sampling data into two categories, attribute and variable, um, each of which is gathered according to your sampling plans. As corrective actions are taken in response to analysis of statistical sampling and other quality control activities, and as your trend analysis is being performed, defects and process variability should be reduced. Um, the use of statistical sampling during quality control can reduce overall quality costs by helping you to forecast and prevent errors before they occur, okay? Um, attribute sampling data, um, is data from the sample that is counted, such as the number of employees participating in profit sharing, the number of customer complaint calls, or the number of returned items. Um, attribution, attribution, attribute sampling uh, uses no scale. Um, it simply tells you whether a standard has been met. Um, implementing an attribute sampling plan is simple. Team members may be required to count the number of items that do not conform to a quality specification or that show evidence of a quality defect. Um, if the number exceeds a certain limit, then the, the sample you know, just fails to meet the quality specifications. Um, then when we talk about variable sampling data, um, this is data from a sample that's measured on a continuous scale, uh, okay, such as time, um, temperature, and weight. Uh, for variable data, the compliance to specifications is rated on a continuous scale. Uh, measurements can fall between an upper and a lower range. Uh, to implement a variable sampling plan, you'll collect a sample of the product and take some specific measurements to determine if the sample meets quality specifications. Uh, variable samples typically provide the same level of accuracy as attribute samples with, mu with much smaller sample scales. 
And so rounding it out, um, let's, let's kind of sum it up with uh, got guidelines to controlling your project quality. Um, monitoring and controlling project quality ensures that the quality complies with relevant quality standards. Meeting quality standards enhances the team ab team's ability to deliver an overall project performance that meets the project objectives. To effectively control project quality, these are some of those guidelines that you'll want to follow. Um, conducting inspections to detect quality errors as project work is going. Uh, when engaging in inspections, You'll consult the quality management plan for the procedures and guidelines to use during quality control um, checks. You'll um, check work results against relevant operational definitions and checklists. Uh, you're going to document those results. And you'll also use statistical sampling to determine whether large batches of a, project, a product should be accepted or rejected based on the quality of the samples. Um, and you'll also ensure that the samples are chosen randomly and that the sample size is large enough to demonstrate the variability of the entire group. Okay. Um, another thing you'll, you'll um, recommendations here are guidelines is to use Pareto diagrams to focus your corrective actions on the problems having the greatest effect on overall quality performance and to measure and monitor the effect of the corrective actions over time. Okay. And then you're going to use your control charts that we looked at to analyze and communicate the variability of a process or project activity over time. As you analyze the performance with your control charts, you, you must not only look for variability outside the control limits, but you've also got to look at the patterns within, you know, the patterns that, um, of data within those control limits, as we noted the seven uh, point rule, right? Okay. Um, you'll identify ways to eliminate causes of unsatisfactory results so that you can minimize the rework and bring non-conforming items into compliance. Um, you're going to use your flow charts to identify redundancies, missteps, or the source of quality performance problems. Um, you'll want to initiate process adjustments by implementing corrective or preventive actions necessary to bring that quality work results into an acceptable level. Major adjustments must be made according to the project's change control system. So your change control, manage, your change control management plan is also going to be an input to your, your quality uh, planning as well. And you're going to continue to monitor, measure, and adjust your quality throughout the project life cycle. So that's with many of the processes that you've been learning about. You, you, you begin to understand nothing is just a one and done. Most, most of these efforts are always you know, being done over the full life and span of the, of the project. And so with that, um, you'll have learned about the task of planning and managing quality of products and deliverables. So Chris, I'll turn it to you or I can open up to questions if anybody has any questions about what we've covered so far. I, I, is that, Chris, can I hear? I, I don't think I hear you. Can Can everybody hear Chris? Can you hear Chris? Uh, you know what, Cindy? Uh, can, can somebody unmute? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear Chris talking? No, I very can't. low. Right. Chris, are you there? Yeah. Hold on. He okay. sounds like really far away. <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't he? I'm so. I was going to ask a question in regards yes. to the control chart. Uh -huh. um, so I was taking a practice exam and that question came up about the control charts. And what he was talking about was the, that if you want to ensure that your project is within the acceptable limits and in control, um, but you notice that there's are seven data points that are grouped together um, towards one side of the mean. It didn't specify if it was above or below. Mm -hmm. um, so like now going through this, I feel like um, I may have answered that wrong. Um, like so what would they be talking about here? Yeah, so, so acceptable limit and in control. So, 
So, so the this is the average number of defects that we would expect, or the target, right? So maybe we've set a limit, right? Y'all, yeah, I think y'all maybe have talked about standard deviation and and things of that nature, but we've mm -hmm. identified the the average number of defects that we would expect our process to to produce, right? Maybe it's one out of ten, or one out of a hundred, or whatever that number is, right? of defects, okay? Um, and then as we're taking our measurements of our samples, right, then we start to find that there's variability, right? So is that, the, as you can see, we've got seven points that are above the mean here and seven points that are below the mean over here. When you have seven points above or, or below, right, then that's an indication that there could be some variability in your process. Well, it doesn't mean. Okay, and then and then so even though it's within the UCL, these points are within the UCL or the LCL. Being seven being above or seven being below can still be an indication that you've got some problems with your process, even though you're within the, the control limits. Oh, uh, okay, I get it. I, I I now am able to see the difference. Okay, whether it's above or below, there is something happening. So I gotta investigate what's going on. All That's right, correct. thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, see, most most uh, of your measurements should be along along the mean, right? Um, mm -hmm. But when you start having them going up, 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 or you know, staying up over, or down, 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 staying down below there, seven in a row, then you probably have some variability, or you might, and you just need to investigate. Yep. Okay. Any Perfect. Other? Thank you. You're welcome. Can you hear me now? No, you're still far away, Chris. Yeah, what's going on? Wonder what. Is that any better? That's perfect. That's much better. Okay. For some reason, I, it was the strangest thing. You were breaking up, and I thought it was you. That's not any good anyway, because you couldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what happened? But I'm back. I restarted my phone. Hopefully, that fixed it. Yeah. All right. Are any you other on... questions, or do you want to keep moving on? I think we can keep moving on. Yep. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Any other questions? <laughs> I'm like, I'm fine. Is everybody else okay? <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, Chris, I think you can take over presenting now if you'd like. Okay. Let's see if I figured out. Okay. I was having some more problems there. All right. Hopefully I got that fixed. And you can still hear me okay? Yes, that's much better. Okay. It always happens, doesn't it? Indeed. <laughs> All right, so we're moving on. So thank you, Cindy, for covering that for quality. Uh, we're going to move on to integrate project planning activity. So we're not talking about building a particular project plan in this this section. We're talking about integrating or the integration of all the different sub plans that we're building to that roll up to the master or just to the project management plan that we call it. Right. So there's a bunch of sub plans. So because of that. We know that throughout the process, especially in the beginning, the plans we're planning, right? Plans are to be developed and they're going to be updated throughout the entire project. Integration of these plans and these components, it's a necessary thing because if we're coordinated, it makes much for a much more efficient uh, project overall. All right. So let's see. Um, so enablers. I'm not going to read through these because we got a lot of slides that kind of break these down, but you can see where these enablers are at and where they fall into if you want to reference them on the reference guide. Okay. All right, and deliverables and tools. So in the old way, we used to call them ITOs, right? Inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs. So deliverables are the outputs, uh, and tools are the what we used to call tools and techniques. So deliverables, we don't have a specific deliver. We're not, there's no specific output because again, we're not building a plan here. This is the integration and the crossover of all the other plans and how they mesh together. And so the tools, it doesn't have any specific tools that we're gonna follow as well. So let's jump into it, integration management. So there are many plans that are built, maintained, executed throughout the entire project. Again, we said this up front, Consolidating these plans together enables the project manager, you, and others to assess and coordinate all the various plans and activities. So you have a good view of it, right? 
So a holistic integrated view ties these plans together and the concentrations allows them to be worked by subgroups of the project team and it aligns the efforts and highlights how they depend on each other. That's a critical piece. So you get to see the, all the plans together from an integrated view and how they depend on each other. So the integrated view of all the plans within a project or a phase of a project or across iterations of a project can identify and correct gaps or conflicts across these various plans. A consolidation of the plans encapsulates the overall plan for the project and its intended business value. So it, again, it encapsulates the overall intended business value of the project as a whole and it pulls it together and knits it together. So project management plan. So you probably know this, right? But a project management plan is a document that describes how the project will be executed, monitored and controlled and closed all of those things. And it's, it's a combination of all these different project management plans that you see on the left. You don't have to have them all, but these are the ones that you commonly find in an overall project. And then the project documents that are making up those particular project management plans, like a uh, scope management plan will have activity attributes and quality control measures. You know, it just kind of lines them up there. So there's generally not one single plan, but many plans that make up the project management plan overall. And these contents and plans themselves will vary by every project with a unique to specific projects needs. The plan is always changing and it's updated, altered, tweaked as the project demands change. So it can happen early on when you're developing the plan, but it also, we're talking about tweak to change throughout the project. So important to note though that changes to the project management plan are controlled and managed through the, what we call the integrated change control process. And we'll learn a little bit more about that as well. So let's talk about project management plan components. So let's start off with baseline. Baseline management is a key component of the project management plan. Most plans will include a description of how the integrity of the project baselines will be maintained. There are a few baselines used when developing a project management plan, and you'll see those listed here. We have scope baseline is one, a common one, schedule baseline, cost baseline. So scope, schedule, cost, those are one of the three big ones that always travel together. Uh, and then performance measurement baseline. Let's move on to subsidiary plans. So these are the plans that make up the overall project management plan. There's several subsidiary plans that it will be integrated into the overall project management plan. And the ones listed here, scope management, requirements management plan, schedule management plan, cost management plan, quality management plan, Cindy just told us about that, right? Resource management plan, communications management plan, risk management plan, procurement management plan. I'm gonna talk about that in, the, in our third section tonight. Then we have the stakeholder engagement plan, the configuration management plan. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. The change management plan. And lastly, the compliance management plan. So a lot of these subsidiary plans and a lot of these are individual chapters in the PMBOK guide that you notice. You probably recognize that. And they break them down and talk about the, uh, like again, the, the inputs, what, what you bring into it to build it, to plan it tools and techniques that you use to build it, and then the outputs. And the outputs are usually what the plan is. Like if you're gonna build a scope management plan, one of the outputs or the deliverable is what we call it, is a scope management plan. So you'll find that commonality. All right, so life cycles next on this page, we have the plan may include a specific life cycle selected for the project and processes that will be applied to each phase of the process. That's what the life cycle is about. Then project processes. Project processes selected for a specific process will be stated within the plan. So you'll find these details. And these descriptions can include the project management processes, mm -hmm. the level of implementation, the tools and techniques, and how the selected processes will be used to manage. And then we have work explanation, which is an explanation of how the project work will be executed to meet the project's objectives. And then the agile project plan, if it qualifies, right? For agile managed plans, the documentation on how the team will work together on the project, how they're gonna manage the resources, the decisions, the timing, and other things. 
Let's see, and let's move on to project management plan tools and techniques. So we first start about expert judgment. An expert judgment is used to the process to adjust the process to meet the specific needs of a project. So expert judgment is really just bringing in experts to get their their judgment on how to proceed. That's don't overthink that one. That's that's what that is, and it's we're talking about determine the appropriate methodology methodology approach. So experts could have been people who have done this before, people that have uh, run a project like this, or somebody that's a subject matter expert in their field, right? Customize the process to meet project needs. You could bring in an expert judgment. Develop technical and management details. Determine the resources and skills that are needed. Define the level of configuration management needed. Identify the project documents that will be affected. Prioritize the work to allocate resources appropriately. These are all things that you can use an expert judgment for. And then we have data gathering. There's a variety of tools and techniques that can be categorized as data gathering. Brainstorming is one of them. That's simply pulling together in a room with individuals and just brainstorming. Checklist is another one. Focus groups is another one. And interviews, uh, pulling information from people, from multiple different people and using that data. So that, again, data gathering techniques. And then we have the interpersonal and team skills used to resolve issues, brainstorm ideas, enable problem solving, manage conflict that may arise over the course of a project. And these are some of the interpersonal team skills that you'll find useful. One is conflict management, facilitation skills, meeting management skills. And then lastly is meetings. It's another tool and technique, right? Meetings are a useful way of assembling the necessary team members and stakeholders to gather necessary information. You've got to meet to talk through it as you go through the project. I think all this is pretty straightforward. These are common tools and techniques that you'd find when you're building out the subsidiary plans and the overall plan. All right, let's talk about Project Management Information System, or PMIS for short. A Project Management Information System it's an information system consisting of tools and techniques used to gather, to integrate, disseminate the outputs of a project management process. The purpose is to collect and make easily accessible all of the project information. For example, Microsoft Project is a commonly one, it's one that's commonly used by project managers to develop and build project schedules. In the agile methodology, projects could use sticky notes, whiteboards, and simple paper Eight, just a regular piece of paper attached on the wall as their project management information system. And there's also some commercial tools like JIRA and Rally. I know JIRA is used in our transformation office. Uh, in my team, project man our global project management, we have a PMIS system we call PICS, where we document all of our milestones on every project, the outputs, everything, uh, lessons learned are documented, the products, the services, uh, I already said milestones, but a plethora of information that we can pull, and it has reporting capabilities. Anybody in our organization can extract data from it. It's really useful, and we use it every day, and that's our PMIS system. All right, so now let's talk about configuration management plan. This is one of the subsidiary plans that was mentioned. So the configuration management plan is a component of the project management plan, a subsidiary. It describes how to identify and account for project artifacts under configuration control and how to record and report changes to them. So the configuration management plan details the following things. Number one is what work products need to be managed, how products will be created, stored, revised, documented, and archived, the processes and the authorization levels for doing so, the naming schemes for different types of versions, version one, version two, version three, or something different. And it also discusses the release management for products which will be released incrementally throughout the project. So again, uh, hopefully that gives you a good understanding of what the configuration management plan is. Next, we have the change management plan. Again, a subsidiary plan that's built into this. So projects managed in an agile approach they welcome changing requirements even late in the development. <laughs> but plan-driven projects, like we find most of ours, right, undergo changes during their lifetime as well. 
New or change requirements can impact the project scope, the schedule, the cost, the risk, the quality. So during the project execution, monitoring can also dictate the need for a change in any of these areas. Right? So it doesn't have to come from a stakeholder. It could come from we're monitoring as we progress and we'd say we do need to make a change. So the change management plan is a component of the project management plan and it establishes the change control board or involvement level of the new product owner, the documents that extend its authority and describes how the change control system will be implemented. So a change, man a change management plan can answer the following questions. One is who can propose a change within the project? What exactly constitutes a change? Does it qualify? What the impact of the change on the project's objectives? What steps are necessary to evaluate the change request before approving it or rejecting it? When a change request is approved, what documents must be amended to record the actions necessary to affect the change? And then lastly, how will these actions be monitored to confirm that they have been completed satisfactorily? A little bit more on this before we move forward is the change management plan is, also, is a sub plan created when the project management plan is created. So up in the front end of the overall arching activities, right? And it's in its definition of change, if scope changes are considered changes, then it also needs to include how changes to the external business environment are going to be assessed, assessed prioritized and integrated as scope and backlog changes. Just a little bit more. All right, compliance management plan, another subsidiary. Another important aspect of the planning process involves compliance goals and requirements. These include compliance with any appropriate government regulations and corporate policies, as well as product and project quality and project risk. The flavors of compliance are often dictated by the project's EEFs and OPAs. You probably had um, exposure to these two acronyms, right? Inter Enterprise Environmental Factors and Organizational Process Assets. I'm going off memory here. EEFs and OPAs. We'll talk a little bit more and define what those are. Project managers use a separate subplan of the project management plan called the project compliance plan. That's what we're talking about. Or they may incorporate compliance aspects into other sub plans such as quality management plan, man, the requirements management plan, and risk management plan. So let me say that again. So project compliance plan can be a standalone sub plan or you can just build in compliance aspects into quality management, requirements management, or risk management plans. You have an option there. But regardless of where information is housed, the plans need to classify classify the compliance categories, determine the potential threats to compliance, and they analyze the consequences of non-compliance, and determine the necessary approach and action to address the compliance needs. All right, so the components that we're talking about, first you'll see there is classify compliance categories. In the standalone subplan, if you go that route, this section is gonna address the types of compliance categories applicable to the project, to this project. These could include requirements, quality, risk, change, et cetera. If integrating compliance into the other subplans, we talked about that as a second option, this thought process allows the project manager to determine which subplans would be affected. So this helps them through that, right? Classify compliance categories. The next one you see is determine potential threats to compliance. This section identifies the stumbling blocks that might keep a project from complying to the variety of compliance categories that you have to. Next, analyze the consequences of non-compliance. Understanding the impact of non-compliance is important because very often the cost of compliance is higher than the results of non-compliance. And then the last one, determine necessary approach and action to address compliance needs. Each identified compliance category should be evaluated for both compliance and non-compliance to decide if each needs to be further addressed. If so, then this section describes the implementation steps to do that. All right. All right, so now we're going to move on. Guidelines to develop the project management plan. 
So we have review the project charter for the high level boundaries of the project. So if we're starting off at the beginning of everything, you know the project charter is one of the first one of the first things that's written to kick off a project, right? It's at that initial thought process that gets it going. So you, if you want to start a project plan, you review the project charter. Start off that way. Review the outputs from the other processes that have already been developed, such as baselines and the other subsidiary plans that are outputs of the planning processes. So remember we said that uh, oftentimes the deliverable or the output is the actual subsidiary plan that comes out of that effort. Then we want to review the EEFs. Again, those are enterprise environmental factors. This includes governmental, industry standards, project management information systems, organizational structure, culture, management practices, and sustainability infrastructure, and personnel administration as applicable to your project. So there's a host of things that come into play when we're talking about EEFs. The, and how it contrasts is OPAs or organizational project or process assets, I think it's project, I'm sorry, including standardized guidelines, work instructions, proposal evaluation criteria, performance measurement criteria, project management plan templates, change control procedures, project files from previous projects, historical information, configuration management, knowledge base. So OPAs or documents and processes and the way that things work, EEFs or standards, government, industry standards, information system, culture, practices. So you get the idea of the difference between these two. I think it will be important to know the difference, what EEFs are and how they're different from OPAs. Then we have used the tools and techniques such as expert judgment to tailor the process to meet the project's needs, develop technical and management details, determine the resources and the skill levels that are needed to perform the project work. You got to get somebody to do those work breakdown structures, right? They got to carry out the work in the project. You want to make sure that your resources are allocated to the appropriate work at the appropriate time, again, as applicable to your project. Next, you want to use facilitation techniques, brainstorming, conflict resolution, problem solving, meeting management are just some of the examples to help you get there. And then document the project management plan. <laughs> Write it down, right? And then last is review the plan components to assess ways to potentially deliver product components and business value incrementally as you go through the project itself. Okay, so now we're going to move on from an, to, to an agile perspective. We're going to talk about scrum of scrums and safe. All right, so start off with project environments where there are multiple agile based projects operating at one time, coordinating plans, analyzing the data and the dependencies between them can be performed on a regular cadence throughout the project. And we're going to talk about how you do that. There's two popular ways to, to organize and analyze the data between these interdependent projects in an agile environment. The first one is scrum of scrums. So as more and more groups within a department or organization implement agile based projects, there emerges the necessity to roll the individual agile projects into a larger formation or levels of coordination. How are you going to knit these different agile projects together so that you don't have them overlapping, right? As such, the scrum of scrums, sometimes referred to as a meta-scrum, you may see it that way as well, is a method wherein two or more scrum-based agile projects, they send representatives, individuals, to an oversight scrum team organization in order to be knowledgeable of and coordinated to each other's efforts and progress. So simply put, you have multiple scrums, they'll send an individual to this scrum of scrums or meta-scrum and they'll share what they're working on, they'll share, look for these overlaps and things like that. So that's pretty straightforward. Scrum of Scrums is sending in individuals to a higher level team. And then you have the Scaled Agile Framework, uh, also known as SAFE for an acronym. The SAFE Framework, more commonly referred to by its acronym, is a more holistic view of agile approaches across the organization or enterprise. The focus of SAFE is to build useful knowledge base of scaling development work across all levels of the enterprise. To accomplish this, organizations are not simply applying agile methodologies 
as a small team at the local level, but they also need to think larger, more systemic ways. Knowledge is shared and cultivated across the organization. Safe methodology promotes alignment, collaboration, and delivery across large number of agile teams. So the key word there, I think, is methodology, right? This, it's a framework, it's a methodology that an organization uh, has built a knowledge base so that things don't overlap and cause conflicts. Whereas Scrum of Scrums is really, it's just an activity where you take individual representatives from multiple scrums, bring them together, and they talk about what they're doing. So hopefully that, that does kind of clarify those two things. I would study those and make sure you understand what the difference is. Then we have guidelines to determine critical information requirements. So again, requirements is what we're all about in a project, right? That's what we're doing this for. We have to determine what are the requirements of a project. We get those from our stakeholders. So the first one is review the project stakeholders identified for the project. Who are my stakeholders? Review and update the communication needs and expectations for each stakeholder because each stakeholder may be different levels within the company and you may meet with them once a month, once a week, multiple times a week. You may email them or text them various ways. And under the communication plan, you get into that. Determine the primary points in the project that have the most touch points or stakeholders affected. You gotta look for those points that are concentrated within your project. You evaluate those project points for the information contained. What is it that is causing that concentration? Assess whether the information is best communicated to stakeholders. Maybe you don't wanna share everything with the stakeholders. You wanna be selective. Examine smaller points around the primary points to assess the value to the stakeholders. Is this something that you need to alert them of or share or update to those stakeholders? Then you prioritize the points of information needs from top to bottom, most important to least. You agree as a group with the impacted stakeholders a cutoff line between the most business critical information and those less critical. So again, where do you share, where do you cut the line to share and not share? and set those at higher priorities to be critical information requirements. And that's what we're talking about, critical information. And review and up these requirements regularly. So you have a cadence throughout the project to this particular stakeholders and you update them on this critical information. I think this is hopefully pretty up straightforward as well. And that takes us to a break. So I know we got a lot to cover. I don't wanna take this, to, let's just take a five minute break and let's come back and we'll hit plan and manage procurement. That gives everybody a chance to go grab a drink, do whatever you need to do. So I got 713 Eastern Standard Time. So let's come back at 718 and we'll kick it off. I'm gonna be right here. So if anybody wants to hang out and ask a question, you can uh, unmute and do so as well. All right, talk to you in uh, five minutes. Thanks guys.
All right, guys, I have uh, 7.18 Eastern time, so let's go ahead and jump back into it. All right, so integration is what we covered. Now we're going to talk about plan and manage procurement. Uh, at the front of our call, I said that we try to make it fun and interesting. I didn't say we always deliver. So these are, these are some hard hard sections to cover and to get through. They're, they're not as fun and interesting as some of the other ones, unless you're in this, unless you like it. I don't know. Maybe you do. So, all right. So let's start off with, as you execute your project, you might need to procure an external resource so you can meet your project's objectives. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you're procuring products and services from external suppliers, you have to require that you identify the suppliers, you have to obtain bids or proposals from them, and you have to award contracts based on their evaluation. All procurements for the project must be done within specified parameters of time, cost, quality to ensure that the project meets the stakeholders' requirements. That is what plan and management, plan and manage procurement is all about. So, these are our enablers. I'd like you to just read through those for one second. All right. And then let's talk about deliverables and tools. So deliverables, again, are outputs. So we have a statement of work. Uh, many of us have probably worked with statement of works, SALs, right? And we'll talk about the definition, what it's used for, and everything like that. Procurement management plan is an output. We're talking about a subsidiary plan here, procurement. So obviously, it is going to be an output. Source selection criteria, we'll define that. Select sellers, pretty straightforward, but we'll talk a lot about that. Monitor work and changes, and we'll talk that too. We have our tools, make or buy analysis, we'll define that. Market research, meetings, expert judgment, there's a tool again. Set up evaluation techniques and bidder conferences, we'll define that. Negotiations, prepare agreements. Monitor and work deliverables and prepare and process change requests. All right, so unless a project is extremely small, very few organizations can do everything to complete it within their in-house resources. The project team will need to decide which resources they will need to procure from the outside. Procurement is the acquisition of goods and services from an external organization, a vendor, or a supplier to enable the deliverables of the project. So let's start off. A make or buy analysis is the process of gathering and organizing data about product requirements and analyzing them against available alternatives, including the purchase or internal manufacturer of the product. All right, so make or buy analysis is gathering information, and analyzing the data. A make or buy decision are decisions made regarding the external purchase or internal manufacture of a product. These decisions can significantly impact project time, cost, quality. In the case of a buy decision, you must also consider if the product needs to be purchased, leased, or rented. So these things come up. So when considering a make or buy decision, it's important to consider several factors. We have consider the impact on cost, time, and quality. For instance, if a current personnel must be retrained for services that are requiring a new skill set, it may be less expensive to outsource those resources as opposed to train your resources to do it. Next, consider the ongoing need of a specific skill set. Even for future unrelated projects, it may be a worthwhile investment to train current personnel to perform that service. Kind of like the opposite of what we just said, right? Then you have to think about the learning curve. Although it may make financial sense to develop an in-house solution, there may not be enough time to train the personnel and or the implement the necessary policies and the equipment to produce that solution. You have to take that into account. And then lastly, if the required resources are readily available internally, the organizations will usually use them. However, if the project involves technology, skills, materials, or resources, that are beyond the organization's capabilities, it may be cost effective to hire outside help. All right, so when you're doing the make or buy analysis, you can use um, some different financial tools. You don't see them listed on here, but they are a benefit cost analysis. I think these are all in your PMBOK guide. Return on investment, we also known as ROI. The internal rate of return, also known as IRR. 
And then the net present value, also known as NPV. So anybody from a finance major in college, you're familiar with those terms probably, right? There also can be situations where an organization does not need or wish to procure a resource, but instead chooses to join forces with another organization to fulfill a portion of the project scope. So you don't have to buy, you can trade or you can join forces, right? There's also something I'll just mention before we move on is a teaming agreement. A teaming agreement is a legal contractual agreement between two or more parties to form a joint venture or any other arrangement is defined by the parties to meet the requirements of the business opportunity. The parties can be internal or external to the organization executing the project. And when a teaming agreement is created for a project, it significantly affects the planning process for the project and predefined issues such as scope of work and competition requirements. So all these things have to be taken into account when you're doing all the planning. So that's a procurement strategy. Now let's move on to the procurement statement of work. So a procurement SAL, I'll just say that, a SAL describes a procurement item in sufficient detail to allow the prospective seller, and again, in this case, the seller is the person that's gonna, or the company that's gonna be providing the service or the product that we're gonna be buying, right? So they're the seller, to determine if they are capable of providing the product services or results. So a statement of work defines what is what are we asking for. It's distributed to the potential sellers who will use it to evaluate their capability to perform the work or provide the service. In addition, the SAL will serve as a basis for developing the procurement documents during the solicitation process. The information in this project scope baseline is used to create the procurement SAL. So again, information in the project scope baseline is one of the documents for that is used tomorrow. to create. Oh. Um, I'm sorry? I'm, sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm just saying that trip. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, I don't know. Lloyd, Lloyd Harrison, if you are, you're speaking, if you had a question, I, feel free to speak up. No, I don't have a, a question. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. Not a problem at all. Okay. So that's a procurement sow <laughs> statement of work. Now we have the procurement management plan, right? So this is the output, this is a subsidiary plan to the project management plan. So the procurement management plan is a component of the project or program management plan and it describes how the project team will acquire goods and services from outside the performing organization. So it could be internal but or external to the company, but just outside your organization. It specifies the type of contracts that we use it describes the process for obtaining and evaluating bids. It mandates the standardized procurement documents that must be used, and it describes how multiple providers will be managed. It's a lot. The plan also states how procurement activities will be coordinated with other project management activities, such as scheduling and performance reporting. Depending on the needs of the project, the procurement management plan may be formal or informal, brief or highly detailed. For example, a small advertising agency would procure contracts from external sources or some of the work considered necessary but beyond its core capability, such as specialized printing or professional photography services. So again, a small advertising agency may not be good at printing or photography, right? So they can procure it from the outside. The procurement management plan would, also, would outline the company's processes for soliciting and evaluating bids from competing service providers and would specify how the management would schedule the contract work, schedule the payments to the providers, the work done and evaluate the quality of the work. So like any other project plan, if you haven't learned this by now, you do a heavy load of planning on the front end. If you do it correctly and you plan out everything, then not only do you have every possible process that you would probably need to pull out and put into play already defined and in your project management plan. You've also thought through the risk. You've thought through how you're gonna mitigate the risk when something comes up. So a solid project management plan, whether it's just a subsidiary plan or an overarching plan, it really thinks through every possible scenario so that you don't have to pause in the project and go back and say, how are we gonna do this? We didn't, we didn't take this into account. We didn't consider that this might happen. 
if you plan correctly, you consider pretty much everything that could happen, how you're going to react to it, how you're going to overcome it. So just a couple other things. For the PMBOK guide, what you're going to find is you're going to get guidance for coordination of procurement with other aspects of the project, how it, how it integrates with other aspects. You're going to get a timetable of the key procurement activities. You're going to get procurement metrics used to manage the contracts. You'll see that. You'll see stakeholder rules and responsibilities related to procurement. You're going to see constraints and assumptions that could affect the planned procurements. You're going to see legal jurisdiction and currency in which payments will be made, determination of whether independent estimates will be used, procurement-related risk management issues, and pre-qualified sellers, if any, that you have to use or want to use. Okay. So the PMBOK guide has a lot more detail into it. So now let's talk about source selection criteria. What's your criteria for selecting a vendor or a company to provide it? So source selection criteria is a set of attributes desired by the buyer which a seller is required to meet or exceed to be selected for a contract. Makes sense, right? In other words, these criteria are the standards used to rate or score the proposals, the quotes, or the bids, and form a part of the procurement solicitation documents. Some criteria are objective and can be readily demonstrated and measured. Other criteria are subjective and open to different interpretations. Objective criteria tend to be much more specific than subjective, right, because it can be measured. So source selection criteria samples, we have overall or life cycle cost. Does the selected seller produce the lowest total cost of ownership, which includes the purchase cost plus the operating cost? Once you buy something, you still have to pay to operate it. Next, you have understanding a need. How well does the seller's proposal address the procurement sow? Are they hitting all the points? Then there's technical capability. Does the seller have or is the seller expected to acquire the technical skills and knowledge needed for the project. Then management approach, does the seller have or can the seller reasonably develop the management processes and procedures to ensure a successful project? Are they big enough? Do they have the capability? Then you have uh, technical approach, not technical capability, but approach. Do the sellers propose technical methodologies, the techniques, the solutions, and services meet the project requirements? And you have warranty. Does the seller provide a warranty for the final product? And if so, for what duration? You have financial capacity. Does the seller have or is the seller expected to obtain the necessary financial production capacity and interest resources? And then production capacity and interest. Does the seller have the capacity and interest to meet the project requirements? And business size and type. Does the seller company meet a specific category of business defined by the buyer or established by the governmental agency and included as a condition in the contract. For example, some contracts would, uh, they want to purchase from a small business, a woman-owned business, or a disadvantaged business. And then past performance of sellers, does the company, us, the one doing the buying, do we have experience with the selected sellers from the past? Then references, does the seller provide references from previous customers they've worked with, verifying their work experience and the compliance with contractual requirements of others? Intellectual pr property rights, are intellectual property rights established by the seller in work processes or services to be used for the project? And then lastly, proprietary rights, the standard proprietary rights. Are proprietary rights ensured by the seller in the work processes or services to be used for the project? So a lot of things to consider, the criteria that goes into source selection, right, is what we're talking about. So now we move on to qualified vendors. Qualified vendors are vendors approved to deliver products, services, or results based on the procurement requirements identified for a project, right? So you got that far. A list of qualified vendors can be created based on historical information about different vendors who delivered resources for prior projects in your organization. 
If the resources you require are new to the organization, you may need to do some market research to identify the qualified vendors for each resource. You can perform an internet search, <laughs> it's like Google, right? Using specific search criteria to expedite the process. This research will generate a list of possible vendors. You'll need to interview the prospective vendors, maybe visit their work site, review their work samples, interview their references they provide, check with their certifications with the certification boards, or use other approaches to validate whether they qualify as vendors for the procurement requirements. Many vendors publish an internet knowledge base that contains information about their products and services where you can search for specifics that will help you determine whether a company should be included as a qualified vendor. So a lot to take in just to qualify vendors, but again, it's all about the planning. So what comes out of this is you can produce a qualified vendors list and it just gives you a sample of what it might look like. So the qualified vendor list contains details regarding vendors who meet the organization requirements and whom requests can be sent to. So we've gotten now, we've qualified them, here's the list, here's who you're gonna send the request to. It's sometimes known as an approved vendors list. That's another word you could use for it. The request for information or also known as RFI for each vendor is scrutinized and evaluated for qualifying vendors. The term qualified vendor does not mean the organization is bound to do business with them. It only indicates that when needed, the organization will interact with the vendors and request for proposals or uh, also known as RFPs, invitation for bids, IFBs, or request for quotes, RFQs. These are gonna be sent to the qualified vendors. And generally the vendor identification number or vendor registration number is assigned to qualified vendors. So not only do you have their name to categorize them, but you can go further and give them a, 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 vendor, indicate, a vendor identification number or a registration number to keep them straight, depending on how many you have, right? How complex your project is. All right, so now another Another way to take it even further is what we call bidder conference, conferences. And a bidder conference is a meeting conducted by the buyer after <laughs> issuing the request for proposal, but prior to the submission of a bid or proposal by the vendor. So once you kick out the RFP, you can then hold a bidder conference, conference and have the vendors attend it, whether it's virtual or in person, and you can restate the requirements. You can ask que answer questions that they may have. So it gives everybody an opportunity to get on the same level. They understand what you're asking for specifically, and they may share one idea or one question may spur somebody else to have a similar question and so forth. So during this meeting, the buyer explains the requirements, the proposed terms, conditions, and the buyer clarifies any, any questions that come up. The buyer is usually the one that facilitates the conference because we want to make sure if you're the buyer that you, the prospective vendors have a clear common understanding of the technical and contractual requirements of the procurement. These bidder conferences can also be called vendor conferences, pre-bid conferences, pre-proposal conferences, or contractor conferences. So you may hear them in different terms. But I think here, the important thing is just to have a good understanding of what it is. All right, external resource requirements and needs. Outsourcing, that's what we're talking about. Outsourcing refers to moving beyond the organization to secure services and expertise from outside source on a contract or short-term basis. It is done for core work that has traditionally been done within the organization. Think about all the things AT&T has outsourced, right? Traditionally done inside, we outsource it. Outsourcing is used frequently because it allows businesses to focus more on their core competencies. On the other hand, many businesses are emphasizing that work should be kept in-house wherever possible in an effort to maintain stricter quality controls and security measures. Now, as a project manager, you need to work within the expectation and the constraints that come out of either situation. Okay. Now, let's talk about communication. Like it says, communication is a critical component of the procurement process because it always involves people outside of the procuring organization where misinterpretation or misunderstanding of intent is possible. You have to be clear. 
The project's communication plan should include provisions for working with vendors or suppliers, such as periodic progress reports of supplier activities. So progress reports, updates. Advanced notification of potential supplier cost overruns or scheduled delays and acknowledgements by the project manager to the supplier. So again, advanced notification is the key word there. And then formal acceptance by the project manager of a supplier's contract deliverables when they deliver, when they meet the requirements that you've given to them, you have to have a formal acceptance so that it's documented and they know exactly when they've met their needs, your needs. All right, now suppliers and contracts. Contracts are mutually binding agreements that are obligate the seller to provide the specified product or service or result, and they obligate the buyer to pay for it. <laughs> That's a pretty straightforward definition of a contract, right? Although contracts are customized for each agreement, they tend to fall into a number of standard patterns, such as fixed price, cost reimbursable, or time and material contracts. All right. We're going to get into the details in just a second. But components of a contract. So we have description of work being procured for the project. It's deliverable in scope. So a DOW, not an SOW, right? A delivery date and, or other schedule information, identification of authority, responsibilities of both parties, management of technical and business aspects, price and payment terms, provisions for termination, and applicable guarantees and warranties. So this is a high level view of components of a contract. Now, let's dig into contract types. These are important ones for you to understand. These will show up on your um, test because they did on mine, I remember. So we're going to go in, um, I'm going to talk about fixed price and then I'm going to give you some examples of different kinds of fixed price. They're not on these slides, but they are in your PMBOK guide. So you do need to find and study these different types of contracts. So let's jump into it. So first up, fixed price. It's an agreement that sets the fee that will be paid for a defined scope of work regardless of the cost or effort to deliver it, All right? That's important. You need to know the definition. Also called a lump sum contract, it establishes a total price for a product or service. The seller agrees to perform the work at the negotiated contract value. This value is based on anticipated cost and profit as well as premium to cover unforeseen problems. So anticipated costs, it gives you an idea, and a premium to cover unforeseen problems. The contract may include incentives for meeting or exceeding requirements, such as a scheduled milestone. Fixed price contracts provide maximum protection to the buyer. That's a key part there. You'll need to know that. Fixed price contracts provide maximum protection to the buyer, but require a long time for preparation and bid evaluation. Because this type of contract is tied to a fixed cost, it's most suited for projects with a high degree of certainty about their parameters. So benefits the buyer. All right, so some different kinds of uh, fixed price contracts. The first one is called a firm fixed price contract or an FFP. Again, it's not on the slide. You'll need to find it in your, in your PMBOK guide. The FFP is a type of fixed price contract where the buyer pays the seller a set amount as defined by the contract, regardless of the seller's cost. Right? It's a commonly used contract favored by most buying organizations because the price for the product or service is set at the outset and it's not subject, subject to change unless the scope of work changes. Right? So that's a, that's a straightforward FFP contract. The next is a fixed price incentive fee contract or an FPIF. And that is a type of contract where the buyer pays the seller a set amount as defined by the contract and the seller can earn additional amount if the seller meets predefined performance criteria. So they have incentives built in. Financial incentives are tied to achieving the metrics that are agreed earlier, agreed on earlier. And then there's a third fixed price kind of contract. It's called fixed price with economic price adjustment contract or an FPEPA contract. This is a fixed price contract, but with a special provision allowing for predefined final adjustment to the contract price due to change conditions such as inflation, cost increases, uh, decreases for specific commodities. This kind of contract protects both the buyer and the seller from external conditions beyond their control. 
That's the sentence you need to know. Protects both the buyer and the seller from external conditions. It's used whenever the seller's performance uh, <laughs> spans a considerable period of time. So if you're, if you're doing a project that's gonna go for maybe multiple years, things are gonna change. The economic price adjustments the EPA clause must relate to a, a reliable financial index. So you can't, you can't just make it subjective, right? You say cost of milk went up, so everything else is in relation to it. You have to settle onto a financial index that you both agree upon. All right, so that's fixed price. Now you have cost reimbursable as a second category. And this is a type of a contract that involves payment to the seller for the seller's actual cost plus a fee that typically represents the seller's profits. So I'm gonna pay you the cost plus a profit. Incurred costs are generally classified as direct costs, those incurred for the project or indirect cost allocated to the project by the organization as a cost of doing business. These contracts sometimes include incentives for meeting certain objectives such as cost schedule or technical performance targets. So you can have incentives built into these too. This approach is tied to the actual cost to perform the contract and therefore must be suitable if project parameters are uncertain. All right, so the kinds of cost reimbursable contracts, we have a cost plus fixed fee, CPFF contract. A type of cost reimbursable contract where the buyer reimburses the seller for the seller's allowable cost <laughs> and the allowable costs are defined by the contract plus a fixed amount of profit the seller receives a fixed fee payment calculated based on the initial estimated project cost. The fixed fee does not change due to seller performance. So it's kind of a straightforward one. You'll see the patterns here. The first one's a straightforward one. Then you have the cost plus incentive fee contract or the CPIF is a type of reimbursable contract where the buyer reimburses the seller for the seller's allowable cost the allowable costs are, defined, or the costs are defined by the contract and the seller earns its profits if it meets defined performance criteria. So that's where it comes in. In case of the final cost is lesser or greater than the original estimated cost, then both the buyer and the seller will share the cost from the difference based on a pre-negotiated cost sharing formula. That's another key part on this one you'll need to know. For example, 80-20 split over under costs is the way that they may, they may run it. And then the third and final cost reimbursable is the cost plus award fee or the CPAF. All right, so a CPAF is a category of a contract that involves payments to the seller for all legitimate actual costs incurred for completed work plus an award fee representing the seller profit. This is another way to call it, right? The majority of the fee is earned based on the satisfaction of certain boards subjective performance criteria defined by incorporated into the contract. So you will have subjective performance criteria that's highlighted in the contract and it may be a board that meets and determines if uh, how you performed and they will award that fee either, you know, 100% or anything different. So the determination of the fee is based on the buyer's subjective determination of the seller's performance and is generally not subjected to appeals, meaning uh, if you don't like it, you can't usually take it back and say, I want, you, I, want to, I want you to look at it again, once and done. All right, so those are the cost reimbursable. And then we have time and material. So time and material, or T&M, is a type, type of contract that's a hybrid contractual arrangement. So remember the word hybrid. It contains aspects of both cost reimbursable and fixed price contracts. So we're, we're blending fixed and cost reimbursable into that. So the buyer pays the seller and a negotiated hourly rate and full reimbursement for materials used to complete the product. So they pay for time and materials. This contract is used for staff augmentation, acquisition of experts, and any outside support where a precise statement of work cannot be quickly prescribed. Many organizations include not to exceed values and time limits in the TMN contracts to prevent unlimited growth costs. So it's a blend, cost plus materials. Remember that. And then we have, it's not shown on here, but uh, just a understanding around term versus completion types of contracts. So a term contract engages a seller to deliver a set amount of service measured in staff hours or a similar unit over a set period. Term is like 
term life, right, for insurance, for example. It's a set time. A completion contract stipulates that the work will not be considered complete until the seller delivers the product to the buyer and the buyer accepts the product. It's shown as complete, right? I think that's pretty straightforward. Term versus complete, different types of contracts. All right, let's keep rolling. So we have delivery solution. The ultimate goal of procurement is the delivery of procured goods or services by the supplier to the procuring organization. <laughs> the following phases are typically considered, although the details of each phase will vary depending on the specific procurement and contract. So we have different solution delivery phases, planning and analysis, detailed design, implementation or installation, testing, training, handover, and support and maintenance. Uh, pretty straightforward, right? If you're thinking through on a lot of different examples what that means. All right, and then we have control procurement process. So if you've gone through some of the control processes, this will make sense. The control procurement process is the process of managing procurement relationships, monitoring contract performance, and you're in the midst of the project, you want to monitor how is that contract performing. It also includes making changes and corrections and closing out contracts as part of the control procurement process. That will be an important thing to understand. Uh, you'll have these control processes. Uh, you'll see those in different aspects within the overarching project plan as part of integration, right? Um, you'll have monitor and control pop up. So just know what pro control procurement process is all about. Okay. Then we have contract change control system. The contract change control system is a system used to collect, to track, to adjudicate and communicate changes to a contract. It could be a component of the integrated change control system or it might be a separate system altogether but it is dedicated specifically to control contract changes. It specifies the process by which the project contract changes can be made, and it includes the documentation, the dispute resolution processes, and appropriate levels to authorize the changes to contract specifications. So if you memorize the, that, that up in blue, I think you'll be okay. All right, so now let's talk about types of contract changes. Either party, the seller or the organization that hired the seller, can propose a contract change request for any of the contract terms, including the scope, the cost, the delivery date, the quality of goods or the services. The table that we're looking at describes the types of contract changes that you might encounter. So first up, we have administration, administrative changes. These are non-substantive changes to the way the contract is administered and is the most common type of contract change. Know that. Administrative change is the most common type. Administrative changes should be documented and written notifications sent to the seller with clear expectation that the seller will approve and return the change document. Administrative changes require no adjustment and or payment. All right. Then there's contract modification. This is a substantive change to the contract requirements, such as a new deadline or change to the product requirements. Contract modification should be documented and a formal change order should be sent to the seller. Contract modifications may result in claims for payment adjustment. Then there's a supplemental agreement. It's not so much a change, but it's an addition, right? It's an additional agreement related to the contract but negotiated separately. A supplemental agreement requires signatures of both buyer and seller. A separate payment schedule is attached for the work in the supplemental agreement. So it's kind of right along. We have what's called constructive changes. These are changes that the buyer may have caused through an action or an inaction. As a result of constructive changes, a seller is required to change the way the contract is fulfilled. The seller may claim a payment adjustment as a result of constructive changes. And then the last type of contract change we're talking about is termination of a contract. 
So a contract may be terminated due to a seller default or for a customer convenience. Defaults are typically due to non-performance such as late deliveries, poor quality, non-performance on some or all of the project requirements. Termination due to customer convenience may result due to a major change in the contract plans through no fault of the seller. So the customer just say, mm, we're not gonna move forward and we're canceling the contract because we decided we wanted to. All right, legal concepts when managing disputes. Occasionally a buyer and a seller cannot agree that the term of a contract has been met. Are we done? <laughs> Did I deliver okay? In such situations, legal advice is often sought to resolve the dispute. Such legal issues can include a warranty, which is a promise explicit or implied that goods or services will, be, will meet a predetermined standard. The standard may cover features such as reliability, fitness for use, and safety. Some warranty agreements may promise repair or replacement of products or services for certain months, for years, or for life, lifetime warranty. Waiver. The giving up of a contract right, even inadvertently, you waive your rights. Breach of contract, the failure to meet some or all of the obligations of contract, they may result in damages paid to the injured party, litigation, or other ramifications. A cease and desist letter, a document sent to an individual or a business to stop allegedly illegal activities and to not undertake them again. Such a letter can be used as a warning of impeding legal action if it's ignored. All right, and then um, another is negotiated settlements. You see it in the second bullet up at the top. Negotiated settlements are undertaken to arrive at a final equitable settlement for all outstanding issues, claims, disputes by negotiation. The parties may resort to alternative dispute resolution, also known as ADR, which includes mediation and arbitration. If settlements cannot be achieved through direct negotiations held between parties, so they may take it to that level. All right, now let's talk about guidelines for handling disputes. Project managers should have a general understanding of contracts and breaches of contracts, but they are not expected to be legal experts. The best way to protect yourself, your project, your organization is to make sure that your legal department reviews and approves all contracts before you sign them. As a general guideline, you should never sign a contract unless you are sure that you understand all of its terms. Other guidelines for handling legal issues include have a good understanding of the differences between important legal terms that can, if ignored, have significant impact on the project, a warranty waiver, and breach of contract, for example. Be sure to consult with somebody in your company's legal department or seek advice from outside legal experts so you thoroughly understand any contracts that could affect your project. And then third, if your contract isn't written specifically to exclude inadvertent waivers, avoid doing any of the following that would waive your contract rights, rights including accept a product that fails to meet the standards for quality or performance, don't accept it, accept late deliveries, or overlook an aspect of nonconformance to contractual obligations. Overlook is the key word there. All right, let's see, I'm gonna take a quick peek here. How many, we have just a few more slides and I know we got four minutes, so I'm gonna keep rolling and see if we can close this out. Closing procurement. A procurement is closed when a written notice is provided from the buyer to the seller once the contract is complete. It's usually documented in the terms and conditions that were specified in the contract and the procurement management plan. Procurements can be closed throughout the life of the project as the contracts or satisfies are closed. Not always gonna happen at the end of the, uh, the project. <clears throat> Closing a procurement includes the following actions. You verify that all deliverables are acceptable to the procuring organization. And then provision for final settlement of payments to the supplier. So you double check, make sure everything looks good and you pay them. Guidelines to closing procurements. And number one, ensure that all required products or services were provided. Make sure that any buyer furnished property or information was returned to the buyer. Settle any outstanding contracting, contracting issues. Are there any claims or investigations pending on the contract? Conduct a procurement audit to identify successes and failures of the procurement process and evaluate the performance of the seller. 
address any outstanding invoices and payments, archive the complete contract file with the project archives, provide the seller with the formal written notice that the contract has been completed, and communicate that all procurements are closed and update the OPA's documents as needed. A lot of work, but it helps you and it helps future projects. Then we have guidelines to manage suppliers and contracts. So regardless of the project size, the project manager, that's you, is responsible for administering procurements for the project. Experienced project managers always rely heavily on the contract administration expertise of their organization's procurement, purchasing, and legal departments. So I mean, lean on them, reach out. Effective procurement control ensures that the seller's performance meets the contractual requirements and objectives. To control procurements, follow these guidelines. One is index and store all contract correspondence for ease of retrieval. So again, for yourself and future projects. Develop and implement an effective contract change control system. The system should be integrated with the project's overall change control system and should include these elements. Forms and paperwork required to request a contract change. What's the process, right? Contract performance tracking mechanisms. Procedures for submitting and approving change requests, including approval level based on cost or impact of change. And procedures for reviewing and resolving contract disputes. Next is evaluate the risk of each contract change request. A guideline, right? And then document all contract changes and, and incorporate any effects of the changes into the project plan. Then develop and implement an effective performance reporting system for the seller. Spell out in the contract any performance reporting specification to be imposed on the seller. Set performance milestones to monitor the project's progress. If work is performed on another site, conduct site visits to determine how the seller's work is progressing. And then submit approved invoices for payment in accordance with the contract and the project's payment system. And boom, I have eight o'clock. <laughs> we just, I told you that was a lot, a lot of content. So uh, hopefully I didn't lose you guys, you didn't fall asleep. But uh, I do encourage you to go back into your PMBOK guide and uh, look at some of these details. Hopefully we've given you some hints on what are some of the key things to look for on your exam. So we're done. We hit our two hour mark. So we are done with the content for tonight. I will hang on for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, Cindy, can you hang on as well in case you have any quality questions? I'm here, yes. All right. So guys, thank you very much. Have a great night, and we will talk to you later. We'll be teaching some other classes coming up. Again, if anybody has any questions, you can unmute and ask. So, Cindy, we timed that out perfectly, didn't we? <laughs> we did. Yeah. You're right. A Thank lot you, of Cindy. Thank you, Chris. Have a good evening. Thank you. See you, Rachel. <laughs> All right, see ya. <laughs> hmm. They try to they they try to cram too much into that session. Uh, that is fun. You, you don't have a chance to breathe and, and expand. Yeah. You just gotta plow through it. Yeah. All right. Well, Cindy, I'm going to go ahead. I don't like anybody have any questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Let me stop it.